Okay, Chuck Wilson, New Hope Community Church. And just give you a quick update. We'll be meeting at the Gervasios on Sunday, hopefully. I know there's some rain coming, but it looks like we'll be okay for Sunday. But Gervasios, and then the next week too, we'll be at the Gervasios this week and next Sunday. Uh, you can go on the website, www.newhopechurchpa.org to see all that. We're also planning our baptism. So if you haven't been baptized yet, uh, talk to me ASAP. We're just trying to find a place we can have access to the river because lots of places are closed now. And also birthdays, I'll give the shout out just in case we don't have church. Danielle, little D, big D now, uh, turning 11 tomorrow. All right, so that's all going on. So hope, hopefully we can see you live. Uh, most of you can get there live. But for those who can't, hope you in, uh, are blessed by this recording, this video. So the title for today is The Untouchables. The Untouchables. We are under God's protection. We are the untouchables. 2 Kings 6, 16, and 17. And we all need this sermon today because 2020 has been a, a traumatic year, hasn't it? It's a year that we will never forget if we survive it. It's unbelievable what we've been through with the coronavirus starting things off. Everybody's been shut in. Lots of fear, lots and lots of fear. The economy crashing because of it. The jobs, so many struggling with jobs and money has been tight. Then now we have the racial unrest, uh, which has been so sad, but also then now it's gone morphed. There's a lot of riots going on. That's the, the, the even sadder part. Uh, what it's, what it's been hijacked. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, the riots, there's windstorms, millions of acres in the heartland of a knockdown, but a crazy windstorm. Uh, all kinds of crops destroyed, the corn and the soybeans. It's going to have an effect. There's fires. Oh my goodness, uh, out in California, these, these uh, uh, fire nados and fires tearing through the second and third largest fires in California history burning right now. Uh, it's just been crazy. Uh, and then locusts, don't forget the locusts, not here, <laughs> thankfully. But uh, in Africa, there's been a lot of locusts in the Middle East, a lot of uh, massive swarms of locusts. And now they're talking about aliens. They're, they're monitoring the aliens. Even the government's releasing videos monitoring the aliens. Why are, they, why are aliens showing up? I have my theories. But, uh, but also, even crazier is this asteroid. There's an asteroid that they've been tracking, and they said there's a chance it could hit the Earth and right before the election. <laughs> like the election's not enough. There may be an asteroid that hits before that. This election is threatening to rip our country apart. Unbelievable. We've never been, well, we haven't been this divided since the Civil War. It's unbelievable. I've been doing, in case you haven't followed it yet, I've been doing a prophecy series online being prepared for all that's going on. The title is Making Sense of Our Crazy World. And I'm now moving into the book of Revelation. Start at the beginning and work all the way up. Uh, Mark 13, Matthew 24, the book of Daniel. And now we're starting Revelation. It's all in the Bible. Uh, it's all there. Nothing should surprise us as Christians. We shouldn't be caught unaware. But no matter what happens and how scary it gets, we will see today that we are under God's protection. We are all, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, given our life to him, we are under God's protection. Let's pray. Father, we just pray for your mercy and grace to hear your word and your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts and to change our lives and prepare us for whatever is coming our way, whether it's individual trials, whether it's trials in our country, whether it's worldwide, what is going to happen in the book of Revelation as the time comes for Jesus to return again. Lord, I just pray that we would all be prepared that no matter what hits, we can have peace, the peace that passes understanding. And if anybody is listening to this that has never given their life to Jesus, put their faith in him, turned away from their old life and repented, if they've never done that, that to day that this the moment they're watching this would be that time that they could come under your protection and know true peace peace now and forever in jesus christ we pray that in his name amen okay so quick review last time we saw in the life of elisha how the aramean king ben hadad was trying to trap the king of israel joram but Elisha keeps frustrating his plans because he can see it all happening ahead of time. So Ben-Hadad comes up with plan B. I'm going to catch Elisha first, then go get the king of Israel. So he sends the armies and horses, uh, the army of horses and chariots 
to catch Elisha first. Uh, Elisha's servant wakes up in the morning, sees this army surrounding the city and, and freaks out. But Elisha doesn't freak out. And we saw how we need to open our eyes to the spiritual battle. Last time we talked about opening our eyes to the spiritual battle all around us, invisible to the human eye, but not to the eyes of faith and the reality of the spiritual battle that we are all in. And now today we're going to see how we need to open our eyes to God's powerful protection too. Not just the battle, but that we this, this battle surrounding us. We also have God's supernatural spiritual protection in the midst of this. Let's we're just going to hit the two verses again uh, in 2 Kings 6, 16 and 17. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. If you don't have these verses memorized, memorize them, put them on your phone, put them up on, on the mirror, put them somewhere you'll see them constantly. These verses are key for every Christian. Uh, we Vital, vital, vital. First of all, I want to say something about angels, though, because talking about angels here. Ain't, Hebrews 1.14 says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Get that? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Every Christian is, is, is served and protected and ministered to by angels. I was read a book once, um, Taking Our Cities for God by John Dawson. I have no idea if it's in print. This was years ago. But he talks about angels in the Bible. And I'm just going to read a couple of highlights if you want to look this up and keep this yourself. Billy Graham also wrote an excellent book on angels. Two really, really good classic book, really. But I'm just going to read a couple of highlights from this one. It says, there are many millions of angels. Revelation 5.11. Millions of angels. Angels were created sometime before the creation of human beings. Job 38.7. Uh, we know that a third of the angels followed Satan in rebellion and were thrown out of heaven. Those are called demons today, but the two-thirds that still serve God, millions and millions, the majority of angels serve God. Um, angels were a are able to manifest sometimes in human form, Acts 10.30. Occasionally an angel is revealed in his full heavenly glory, Daniel 10.6. We saw that, remember? They are spoken of in the masculine gender, but do not marry or reproduce, Matthew 22.30. Different categories of angels represent different functions. Cherubim, archangels, guardian angels, Colossians 1.16. Angels worship before the throne of God and continually serve him obediently. Psalm 48.2. Guardian angels are assigned to each child at birth. Matthew 18.10. Angels celebrate before the throne of God every time a sinner repents and comes to God in repentance. Every time a sinner comes to Jesus, they celebrate before God's throne, Luke 15, 10. Angels escort the soul of a Christian to paradise at death, Luke 16, 22. Angels record the good and bad deeds of our life in a book which will be opened at the occasion of the last judgment, Revelation 20, verse 12. Angels are commissioned to execute divine judgment upon persons, cities, and nations, Ezekiel 9, 1, um, 2 Kings 19, 35, lots of different passages. Angels are used by God to bring messages to people, Zechariah 1, 9, 13, and 14, 19. Encounters with angels are usually brief and formal, designed to enhance our relationship with Jesus rather than distract us from him. Revelation 22, 8 and 9. When angels come and, and get attention on themselves and even people start to talk about those angels and even pray to those angels, that's probably not an angel. That would be the counterfeit. Okay? Uh, the Bible warns people not to worship angels. Colossians 2, 18. Angels and Christians are allies in the conflict in which they in which they fight to eject Satan from his position in the earth's atmosphere, prevailing intercessory prayer brings more powerful angels to hinder Satan's work. Hebrews 1, 4 and Daniel 10, 12 to 13. Saw that in the prophecy series. Uh, the work of angels is distinct from that of the Holy Spirit. Angels administer material affairs while the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of God. Jesus was led by the Spirit 
taught by the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, but he is defended and fed by angels, Matthew 4.11. Some angels are assigned to a specific earthly territory. The Bible states that Israel and its cities are under angelic guardianship. In Daniel 12.1, Michael is represented as the Prince of Israel, the Protector of Israel. The prophet Ezekiel records hearing God speak to angels with these words, let those who have charge over the city draw near, Ezekiel 9, 1. So there's just some things about angels. Once again, Billy Graham, excellent book. So God has these powerful angels, these powerful angelic beings under his command. In 2 Kings 19, a little further on, there's an angel that puts to death 185,000 Assyrians, kills them to deliver Israel, uh, the Judah. Uh, in Revelation 15 and, and 16, the chapters 15 and 16, there are seven angels with seven that have pour out seven plagues and seven bowls of God's wrath. So we see the power of these angels that God has. And these are just God's angels. These aren't God. God's power is infinitely higher. God's not fighting Satan. He uses the angels. And we have our battle. We're, we have our battles to face. Just like the angels have the battle against the demons. We have our, our spiritual battles also. Somehow this is God's plan for us as to refine us and to grow us and to prepare us for heaven someday. But but these are just his angels. God's angel, God's power is infinite infinite. He could finish it all right now. God's power, and, and, and Jesus will finish it someday. Revelation 19, just give you a glimpse, and we're going to, uh, I'm hitting all this in re the book of Revelation as we go, but in Revelation 19, 11 to 16, listen to Jesus' power when he finally says, that's enough. Uh, he puts an end to it all. Revelation, if I can turn the page. Uh, I, Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a, dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. That's us. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Oh, there's my sword right back there. I just did use that in the book of Revelation series that I'm doing. You have to listen to that to, to see the sword at, at, at work. Um, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the power, God's power through his son Jesus Christ infinite power, which brings us back to 2 Kings 6, verse 16, where he says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open the servant's eyes. And he, and he opened the servant's eyes. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. We are under God's protection. We are under God's protection. Today, we have the same protection that Elisha had. Remember, Elisha is a type of the apostles. He's a type. The word means, my God is salvation. He's a type of the apostles and by extension, us. We have this same protection. This is a picture of our protection under our God, who is our salvation. Nothing can touch us without God's okay. We see this in the Old Testament. Uh, we see it here, but we see it also clearly spelled out in Job 1, 9 to 10, where Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Have you not blessed the, the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land? He says, no, I can't touch him. Have you, you put a hedge around Job. We can't touch him without God's permission. We know what happened to Job. God did give Job. Did, God did give Satan permission, but he brought Job through that better than ever. Eternally, he brought him through that. And it's a lesson for us that nothing can touch us without God's okay. The same in the New Testament. When, when, uh, when Peter, Jesus said to Peter, uh, uh, let me, I'm going to have to read it. Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat. Uh, I'm going to look it up. I have it, but I, it's in the tip of my uh, mind here, but Luke 22, 
he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fall, fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon. So Jesus does give Satan permission. Satan had to ask Jesus for permission to sift. That's when you pour the wheat in and you separate the shaft from the, the kernels. You separate the bad from the good. And that's why God allowed him to be sifted. Satan attacked him. Same thing, he sifted, sifted Job. Same thing. But what comes out of that sifting, what comes out of that refining is the golden faith, the deeper faith. And that's why God allows it. Same thing. Job couldn't be touched. Simon and Peter couldn't be touched without Jesus' permission. Every trial we face, every attack, every temptation, every sickness, everything must pass through God's purpose test. It has to pass through God. It has to get by God. He's blocking. It has to get by God. It has to go through his purpose test test. If we, God has a purpose for it. That's the only reason it can touch us. If we are hit with a trial, don't look for how to get out of it. That's what we do. We look to get out of it, but look for what we're supposed to get out of it. Do you catch the difference there? Don't look for how to get out of it. Look for what we're supposed to get out of it. That is the key. That is the key. I, I'm going to say it again. Don't look for the ways to get out of the trial. Look for what we're supposed to get out of it. What is God trying to get us to get out of it? That's, that's the key. James 1, 2 to 4 says this. And it's a, 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 once again, I hope you have this one memorized. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish it's work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I got to read this one again. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Joy, <laughs> my brothers. Whenever we face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything anything. We see why God puts us through the trials to mature us, to complete our faith. That's why God allows them. That's why he allows hard things. Same thing, the reason you let your kids go through, you know, more challenges in their schoolwork, because you want them to get smarter, be able to do more. Same thing with a coach puts an athlete through so much more, harder and harder every time, because he wants them to, to reach their potential, get to another potential. God does the same thing with trials in our life, struggles in our life, temptations in our life. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. The word for trials is the same exact word used for temptations that Jesus faced with his tempting. That's the same exact word in the Greek. And, and, and trials, temptations are a form of trial. Trials, struggles, battles, sickness, whatever, spiritual attacks, whatever we face, it's all what God is trying to accomplish in our life. <clears throat> I have uh, Uncle Norm, Uncle Norm Rosso. He passed away, and his wife, uh, my Aunt Carol, also passed away. But after he passed away, she sent me something. She sent me a, a, a teaching that he had put together. He was in the ministry, and he put together this teaching, Seven Steps to Follow When a Trial is Sent into Your Life. And he knew trials. He had cancer, ongoing, long battles with cancer. And I, I'm pretty sure that's what he passed away with finally. But he had so many long, difficult battles with cancer. It was brutal. And look at what she sent me. Seven steps to follow when a trial is sent into your life. I have this hanging in my office. Hand it out to the church for everybody to hang it up. What Number one, when a crisis comes, acknowledge that the Lord is trying to get your attention. Number two, assume that the trial is no accident. It shifts your eyes from circumstances to the Lord. If you say this is no accident, it lets you take your eyes off of that trial and to God. Number three, by faith, thank him. Ouch. That's what the Bible teaches. Thank him for the trial. Your life is in his hands. Anyone who loves you as much as he loves you will never hurt you. Unnecessarily, obviously. Number four, ask the Lord for wisdom to see what he's trying to teach you. James 1.5. 
Number five, be cheerful in your situation. A lot of you aren't. <laughs> I know I get the phone calls, but I know I'm not either. Okay, we'll, we'll own it together. Be cheerful in your situation. Sad complaints are really expressions of doubt in God's wisdom and goodness. Number six, tell God you are willing to make changes. You want to be like Jesus no matter what the cost. When he convicts you that a change is necessary, admit your need immediately so he can relieve the pressure. And finally, number seven, as you feel the pain reaching for maturity, remember this. When I'm getting the worst of it, God is making the most of it to see that I am getting the best of it. Uncle Norm in heaven. Wisdom continues. The encouragement continues. We are under God's powerful protection. We are the untouchables. The untouchables. Elisha. Elisha is an example of that. But it's for us today, still today. I was I one of one of my favorite books on missions is called The Revolution and World Missions, KP Yohannan, uh Mish, you know, Native movement movement for native missionaries all over the world, especially in Southeast Asia. But he, he tells a story, and I actually went to India with Gospel for Asia for a mission trip. Just unbelievable what God is doing there through this ministry. Revolution in World Missions, you never read it. You want to, it's a little quick read, whoa, powerful. But he, in it, he tells the story of a native missionary, Jesus Da. Jesus Das was horrified when he first visited this village in India and found no believers there. The people were all worshipping hundreds of different gods and four pagan priests controlled them through witchcraft and fear. Stories were told how these priests could kill people's cattle with witchcraft and destroy their crops. People were suddenly taken ill and died without explanation. Witchcraft, demonic control. The destruction and bondage these people were living in is hard to imagine. Scars, decay, and death were portrayed on their faces because they were totally controlled by the forces of darkness. When Jesus Da told them about Christ, it was the first time they had ever heard there was a God who did not require sacrifices and offering to appease his anger. As Jesus Das continued to preach in the marketplace, many people came to know the Lord, but the priests were outraged. They warned Jesus Das that if he did not leave the village, they would call on their gods to kill him, his wife, and their children. But Jesus Das did not leave. He continued to preach, and villagers continued to be saved. Finally, after a few weeks, the witch doctors came to Jesus Das and asked him the secret of his power. This is the first time our power did not work, they told him. After doing the pujas, we asked the spirits to go and kill your family, but the spirits came back and told us they could not approach you or your family, because they were always surrounded by fire. Then we called more powerful spirits to come after you, but they too returned, they too returned saying, not only were you surrounded by fire, but angels were also all around you all the time. Horses and chariots of fire. Jesus Das told them about Christ. The Holy Spirit convicted each of them of their sin, of following demons, and of the judgment to come. With tears they repented, renouncing their gods and idols, and received Jesus Christ as Lord. As a result of their pagan priests following the Lord, hundreds of other villagers also were set free from sin and bondage. Just one story of many, many, but once again, just a, a picture that nothing can touch us without God's protection. Now, now we can open the windows. We can open the windows through persistent sin, not just one sin, but persistent sin, sins that open demonic doorways. We can do that. And a lot of times result in addictions. The Bible calls, the world calls them addictions. The Bible calls them besetting sins. It says, do not, Ephesians 4, 29, do not give the devil a foothold. We can give Satan a foothold in our life and he can take shots at us. But um, um, but if we don't do that, Satan can't touch us. And we can repent and break those footholds. If you have footholds in your life, I, 
I hope and pray that you will find some solid Christians and get your freedom. Uh, your pastor, get your freedom. You need to write, get a hold of me. I will help you and I will get you connected, either myself or someone else, help you get your freedom and break those attacks. Uh, if you're not from our church, nhcc at comcast.net. Just send me an email and I'll get you connected with someone who can help you. But if we open the doors and windows, we can get a shot. But if we don't, and if we close them, Satan cannot touch us. We are under God's powerful protection. Under his powerful protection, Satan cannot touch us. The key is, though, do we see with the eyes of faith, like Elisha did, like Elisha did. Do we see with um, the, the eyes of faith? Do we, uh, do we, do we, the servant, like the servant learned to do, remember the servant was all freaked out, but he learned to see with the eyes of faith, just like Elijah, do we see with the eyes of faith? At, servant, at first, the servant did freak out. He saw with the eyes of fear. His focus was on the foes, just like what we often focus on the problem, the trial, what's hitting us, what we're facing, instead of on God's power, on his purpose, on his promises. We don't focus on his promises or his purpose or his power. Psalm, so many times throughout this coronavirus uh, uh, crisis, which I believe God has a very important purpose spiritually for us. So many times I've taken people to Psalm 91, Psalm 91 verse 5, where it says, you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you, for he will command his angels concerning you. Verse 11, for your consent command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. I don't care what happens to the coronavirus. It can't touch us. It can't kill us unless God has a purpose for it. We can't even catch it unless God has a purpose for it. We are under God's protection. And we know if we get coronavirus or anything, cancer or anything, we know God has a purpose for it. Purpose for that. We know God is going to use that trial to refine us and to bring us to spiritual maturity. James 1, 2 to 4. We know that. And so it's so vital throughout whatever we're facing, coronavirus, whatever, to focus not on the coronavirus, but focus on God's power, to focus on his purpose, to focus on his promises. Do we see with the eyes of faith, like Elisha? Does everything that happened pass through the lens of faith in our life? And once we do that, everything changes. Everything changes once we do that. We realize that we're under God's powerful protection. It frees us up to live in God's peace no matter what happens. We still have peace because we see it through the eyes of faith. No matter what, even the worst thing possible, we can see through faith and have peace. I can tell you that's true because Kim and I went through the worst possible as most of you know we lost our oldest son he died of an accidental drug overdose after seven years of hell uh, battling addictions and so many other things opening many doorways spiritual doorways but but I but although we've asked the question why many times it go why 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 did this happen but that's not the focus our focus from this from day one to this day three years later is God what are you doing? Not why, but what are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? And, and, and we've kept our eyes open and focused on that, and we've seen so much. We've seen what God has done, the, the spiritual fruit that has come through that trial and that tragedy and, 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 and our son's death. We've seen so much fruit in our lives, our family lives, people in the community, People have heard the story. Uh, we've seen so much fruit. But we, but if we didn't have our eyes open, we weren't looking through faith, we'd just get bitter. We would lose hope. We'd lose faith. But instead, we, the, vit, the key is to look with the eyes of faith and see what God is doing. 
we need these eyes. We need these glasses. You got. It's like I have to wear glasses to really see. If I took these off, I couldn't even see. You know the, anything. I'm you know blind. But but we all need to put on these spiritual glasses of faith to see what's going on in the USA today. We are in crazy times. Are we looking at it with the eyes of faith? Most people aren't. Most people are freaking out. They. I just saw a news article that the the Google searches for panic attack and anxiety attack have hit an all time high off the chart everybody's you know, everybody's in anxiety and panic attacks because we're they, they don't have faith in Jesus Christ or are not living by that faith we as followers of Jesus Christ must see with the eyes of faith we must respond with faith the question we must ask is not not why you know what's going to happen but what is God doing what is God trying to accomplish what is his purpose for what is happening in the USA today and we might not like the answer <laughs> we might not humanly like the answer you see God has a different goal for Christians in the USA today God has a different goal than most Christians have in the USA today he has a different goal for his church in the USA today than most Christians have for the, the church uh, in the, or their lives most Christians goal can be summed up as safety and prosperity. Isn't that what we really deep down want? We want to be safe and we want to have have what we need. We want prosperity, right? That's why Joel Osteen is so popular. That's what he preaches. It's a false, obviously false teaching, but God's goal is not that. God's goal is to refine us. Fire, that involves fire burning metal, melting. It, it's to refine us. It's to prepare us for the second coming of Jesus Christ, for his holy bride. Jesus isn't coming back for a prostitute. Uh, he's coming back for a holy bride. And we are not ready. The USA Today Church is not ready for Jesus to come back. He's preparing a holy bride. And Jesus' most effective method has always been persecution. Always. Read the book of Acts. Starts right out. God used persecution to refine and prepare and energize and, and evangelize through his church. And it's still his method. Study all throughout history up to today. Most of the Christians in the world today are still under intense persecution. Just China alone, uh, a billion people. There's at least a hundred million Christians there. Just that one country alone, intense persecution. And and uh, the but the, the church is flourishing there. The Middle East, intense persecution. Much of the world, <clears throat> intense persecution. And it's coming to the United States also. God is not going to leave the church in America the way it's looking right now. No, no, no. He's going to refine us. He's going to use very likely, I hope it's revival preaching and we all turn back, but most likely, biblically, it's going to be persecution. Matthew 24, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Just before Jesus comes again, he says, you will be hated by all nations. Guess what? We're part of all nations. Uh, the, the Christians in America are going to face persecution. We need to keep our eyes open. We need to connect the dots. We need to study God's word. God's word and be ready for what's coming. That's why I'm doing this prophecy online series. If you haven't started listening, get started. Start at the beginning and go all the way through. We 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 have to connect the dots and see what God is doing. We have an election coming up. Did you know that? <laughs> we have an election coming up. And I know I'm hoping for an outcome to save babies. That's why we, why discerning Christians, I believe, will vote pro-life. We vote pro-life because we're trying to save babies because we know that's, if we don't stop doing that soon, there will be uh, judgment sooner. Uh, we know that. We're, we're hoping for that. That's our hope and that's what most discerning Christians will vote pro-life. But my prayer even though I'm hoping for that and voting that way, my prayer is for God's purpose and glory. That's my prayer. And, and that trumps my, my hope. <laughs> I'm going to say it right out. That trumps Trump. You know? <laughs> because the prayer that I pray is for God's glory and God's purpose. And that, that may not coincide with what I hope happens to save the baby's lives. All right? Our Vote hopes one thing, but our prayer may result in another 
outcome. God's purpose may be to judge the United States. He may have, we may have crossed the line of grace. He may be sending judgment. He may be sending something that will wake up the church through persecution. That may be what happens as a result of this upcoming election. God's, God's purpose trumps all. <laughs> Okay, Trump saw. Uh, my, my, we, we, I believe the riots, we're already seeing a preview of that. These radicals have hijacked the peaceful, positive racial protests. They have hijacked them, they've overshadowed them. The majority of all folks, of all races, the majority of folks from all races are upset about two things. We're upset together. Both the, my, uh, the, the white Christians and the black Christians are upset together that, that what has sparked the racial protests. We're upset about what has happened to some, uh, some innocent black people, people of, 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 uh, of African-American race. We're seeing some things happen. Now, now not everything that has sparked the riots has been by, from innocent by, uh, to innocent people, but too much has been. There's been too much. And so we together have been upset about that. We're upset about that. But we're also together, black and red and yellow, black and white, we're upset together about what has come about, uh, what, has, what has come about and what has got, turned from peaceful protest into rioting and lawlessness. Nobody, no discerning Christian of any color is, is positive about that. We're, up, we're upset about that. We're upset about what has sparked the protests and what has caused the riots. We're upset about the riots that have, have emerged from this. We're upset. My prayer and hope is that there can be racial reconciliation, that two Christians from all the different races can all together own all of our racial sin. We all, every race has it, right? We join hands together, we confess all together our racial sin, and there can be true racial reconciliation. That's my hope. That's what I'm, I'm hoping for. But I recognize that's my hope, but my prayer is for God's purpose. God's glory. And I recognize that God may use this movement, which started out as a peaceful protest, he may use this movement to morph into something lawless and radical and rioting and, and, and that it's hurting people of all races, hurting uh, our, our, our black brothers and sisters worse, right? The riots are hurting them worse. Look what's happening to their businesses and homes. But I recognize that God may use this radical movement to morph into persecution, morph into persecution. And we're already seeing it. There's, we're seeing these, these, this, this movement is starting to burn Bibles and to desecrate churches and start churches on fire. A lot of the media won't report on it, it's easy to find. It's on. It's in the. It's on the. Uh, uh, on the online. Uh, synagogues are being vandalized. People are spray painting "Free Palestinians." You know, and, and the rioters are showing. I'm not talking about the protesters. The rioters are showing their true colors. They are anti-Christ. They're anti-Christ. But but listen, this may morph. Keep your eyes open. This may morph into persecution. Persecution is coming to the United States sooner or later. It may come soon. It may already be here. It's coming sooner or later. Just like most of the world, most Christians in the world are under persecution. And it's going to come here too. Matthew 24, I already mentioned it, talking about the second coming and Jesus getting ready to come back. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, he tells us what's going to happen. He says, I'm just going to read it for you. He's talking about the contractions, how they're getting closer together and closer together and more intense. And this is what we have to look for. But one of the things is persecution. Matthew 24, verse 7, starting with, he says, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places all these are the beginning of birth pains the birth pains they get more intense closer together wars 
famines, but also this, this is another one. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Coming back to that in a minute. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Mm -hmm. Verse 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. These are all the signs of contractions that are going to get more intense and closer together, leading to the birth, which is the return of Jesus Christ. But verses 8 and 9, all these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. All true Christians, red and yellow, black and white, all Jesus loves the little children. We got the song, obviously. All of us, we are going to face worldwide persecution. Persecution. It's going to happen. Jesus is warning us. It's going to refine the church. It's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the chaff. The wheat, wheat from the weeds is going to separate the true church from the false ones. They're going to turn and betray us. The false Christians... I'd say at least half the church in America is going to be taking the mark of the beast. It's going to be the false church. The only, we are going to go through this time. The only way you will have supernatural peace, the only way we can have supernatural peace is to see with the eyes of faith. And the only way that you can see with the eyes of faith is we must put our faith in Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time that you said, God, I turn away from my life of sin, I repent, I put my faith in Jesus, his death on that cross, his resurrection from the dead to give me a new life. I put my faith in Jesus and have that new life. Let's pray. As we go to this time of prayer, whether you're watching this, listening to this, wherever you are, do you have the ability to see with the eyes of faith? Can you live by faith no matter what you're facing? Do you have peace, supernatural peace? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ, given your life to Jesus Christ? You can do that right now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you can do that right now. The simple prayer of faith. God, I don't want the sin anymore. I don't want the garbage anymore. I don't want the shame anymore. I turn away from them. my old life. Whatever goes against your word, whatever goes against your purpose for me, I repent of that. And I put my faith in Jesus. His death for me. His resurrection from the dead for me. I put my faith in Him, in Jesus Christ. I give my life to Jesus. The simple prayer of faith. But it's not... It may be a simple prayer, but it's earth-shattering. It's life-changing. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, the Holy Spirit has come into you. You will never be the same. You are a brand new creature in Christ, a creation in Christ, a brand new creation. You are a new creature in Christ. That's who you are now, and, and you now have connection to God's power. You're under His protection. And no matter what you are facing in this life, from now until the day you enter into heaven's gates, you have God's protection, and, and you know that he is accomplishing his purpose, and you have peace. You will have peace that you never thought possible because you're trusting in him and his purpose, his power, his presence. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, I want to encourage you to tell somebody Maybe you have a family member or a friend or a, a church that you know of or a Bible study. And if you don't, email me, nhcc at comcast.net, and I'll get you connected. I'll be excited for you and get you connected. 
But for those of us who have already put our faith in, in Jesus, how is God speaking to us? Do we realize, is it reality to us that we are under God's protection? Are we trusting his purpose for whatever we're facing? Are we seeing everything that comes hits us, are we seeing it with the eyes of faith? Maybe you're in a trial today, and maybe in a trial you're trying to get out of it, but maybe you're shifting gears and you say, I'm going to, instead of trying to get out of this, I'm going to try to get all God wants me to get out of it. I want to get everything out of it that he wants me to have. That's your prayer today. Are you ready for the real trials that we see are going to happen as we get closer to the time of Jesus' return? It's going to be intense. The Bible calls it a time of tribulation. It, it, the end times persecution and refining that we are going to face. Are you ready for that? Here's a test. How are you handling the, the trials that you're facing today? That's an indication of whether you're ready to face the real trials. I mean, the, the, the worldwide intense trials tomorrow. Father, I pray that every one of us would know peace. The peace that passes understanding. In this world we'll have trouble, but we know that in you we will have peace. I pray every one of us would know that peace. We would know preparation. We would be, you would achieve your purpose for our lives, for your glory. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.